Prima Media's Mining Weekly is speaking to Trevor Raymond, the Director of Research at the World Platinum Investment Council. Trevor, almost daily now I'm seeing significant announcements on the hydrogen economy in general and the green hydrogen economy in particular. As we speak alongside me, there's a debate going on and there are 50 global energy leaders and all they're talking about is green hydrogen and fuel cells. What is the likely benefit going to be for platinum in your view with all this activity around hydrogen and green hydrogen? Yes, an extremely relevant topic of discussion both for the world for clean air and certainly for platinum. I think what we've seen during COVID is the intense desire to continue with climate uh, change control measures and obviously making hydrogen a mainstream fuel as many uh, countries have done uh, highlights the importance of hydrogen as a sustainable fuel and certainly a replacement for fossil fuels. So the debate has moved to the next level and there's two ways that uh, the hydrogen economy benefits platinum. Firstly, in the generation of green hydrogen, it's a, it's a key player. And certainly in the use for fuel cell electric vehicles, that's fuel cell electric trucks, uh, as well as cars, uh, very important. And, and both have a, have a key role to play. And I'm also seeing fairly significant advertising campaigns develop. And the one that caught my eye was the Hyundai ad and a big double page spread in a major publication and very big commitments there to fuel cell, fuel cell stacks, for instance. They were talking about 700,000 fuel cell stacks a year from 2030. What does that amount to when it comes to demand for platinum, for instance? Martin, yes, to try, and, to try and quantify some of that. So Hyundai is a very important participant in the fuel cell market. One of the most well-known fuel cell electric uh, passenger cars is the Toyota Mirai. Uh, the uh, Hyundai had the iX35 or the Tucson, and they uh, launched their second generation SUV, which is the Hyundai Nexo. And we know SUVs are very popular and that Hyundai Nexo is extremely popular. Um, the other thing that Hyundai are very involved in is in heavy duty trucks. And they've got some specific initiatives in Europe and specifically in Switzerland where Hyundai are rolling out fleets of heavy duty trucks uh, in Switzerland to transport goods, um, groceries uh, on Swiss roads. And the benefit there is that it's just really hard to make a battery electric truck that's big enough. The battery is too big, the charging time is too long. But fuel cell electric trucks are really user friendly and usable right now. Uh, the other benefit is that um, what we've seen with COVID is this the huge cost to governments and what we think that will do is it will slow down the transition between internal combustion engine and electric vehicles. Now, if that is slowed down, it does two things. One, it puts a, a bigger focus on the internal combustion engines that are there for longer. And importantly, then it says, you know, how do you get to the electric and is that uh, carbon free? So the fuel cell provides a carbon free route in terms of transport. So what Hyundai is doing in Europe uh, is to roll out truck fleets, uh, fuel electric uh, vehicle trucks. And these are the, the, the economics of that model is that they're able to build the fueling infrastructure. So you need about 700 uh, fuel cell electric cars to make a hydrogen filling station viable, but you only need about 27 trucks to make a, a hydrogen filling station viable. So what Hyundai's project is doing is actually building um, fuel cell, uh, are building hydrogen refilling stations to support those trucks. So the commitment that Hyundai is showing in the article that you mentioned is they've got a long-term plan and they're saying in 2030, 700,000 stacks. Now, Hyundai haven't given exact loadings for that stack. Uh, we interviewed Ballard, who've been making fuel cells since the 50s, uh, very well um, respected and, and large participant in the fuel cell industry. And Ballard uses uh, two stacks in a class A truck that's about an 85 kilowatt uh, between the two stacks. And each stack is about 37 grams of platinum. So roughly about one ounce of platinum per stack. So what uh, Hyundai is saying in 2030, if they're planning to make 700,000 stacks, that could be 700,000 ounces uh, of platinum per year in the stacks that just Hyundai make. And you know, that's almost equivalent to, to what Rustenberg uh, produces annually. So it's, it's a significant amount of demand uh, for use in that uh, in that situation. What sort of impact do you expect this to have in the short term, 
medium term, long term on the platinum price. And firstly, let's get some idea of the timing of the platinum demand. So Hyundai is talking 2030. And if you talk 2030, there's a, a debate on whether you'll have either 1 million or 5 million fuel cell passenger vehicles on the road. Uh, and that's 10 years out. So what Hyundai are saying, uh, 700,000 stacks, uh, of which a third will go to, to trucks. Uh, and they would have obviously two stacks per truck or about two ounces per truck. So that still leaves 500,000 uh, ounces going into cars. And at the moment, the Mirai and the Nexo also use about an ounce. That should come down with mass production over time. So what uh, Hyundai is saying is that they probably believe that they'd be somewhere between 300 or 500,000 vehicles that would be fuel cell Hyundais as part of a larger global fleet. And obviously that fleet is growing quite aggressively in China. In terms of the short term, and Martin, in terms of the, in, of the investors we speak to, and certainly the investors are trying to take a view on the platinum price, uh, the likely demand for platinum in the short term comes from heavy duty trucks. So those uh, Hyundai uh, Exient um, fuel cell trucks are being rolled out uh, in Europe. Um, Toyota has put the Mirai content into class A trucks. They're trialing those in the port of Los Angeles. And there's many bus fleets around the world, particularly in Shanghai and Beijing, and for the north of China that are converting to fuel cell. So that demand is quite good, but from uh, uh, heavy duty trucks, you're probably looking at about 100 to 300,000 ounces of platinum demand in the next three years. So that suddenly becomes material to the short-term interest. And the second big change is that um, to manufacture hydrogen, most hydrogen today is produced by stripping the hydrogen from fossil fuels. And that's done in a process called steam reforming. Um, the, what that does though, is it can use, um, uh, it, well, it, it, it strips off a fossil fuel, it's, it's not decarbonizing. In order to make green hydrogen, you can use electrolysis. If that electrolysis comes from a coal-fired power station, uh, you, you're going in circles. But where you can use wind uh, or solar uh, electricity, renewable e electricity, to generate hydrogen through electrolysis, uh, that's green hydrogen. And that's really the sustainable route that the debate about the hydrogen economy that you refer to uh, is centering around. It's saying if we can sustainably use uh, wind and solar to generate hydrogen from water, that's a sustainable power source into the future. And that's certainly what's the game changer here. So what, uh, one route to produce that um, green hydrogen is using uh, fuel cell for the electrolysis. And there on the cathodes, you use platinum and iridium. Now until recently, the amount of iridium that you required was far more than annual iridium production. But Arrayas has made an announcement that they've managed to make a catalyst suitable for electrolysis using iridium and platinum, but with significantly lower loadings of iridium, almost a tenth of what they were. So what we do then see is that in the generation of this green hydrogen, there's another maybe 100 to, to 200,000 ounces in the next few years, certainly in, in the order of half a million by 2030, uh, of platinum used to generate the electrolysis. And the Horaeus announcement was really a breakthrough because it means you can generate green hydrogen quite effectively. So those are the good things and certainly uh, short-term platinum demand from trucks and electrolysis and longer-term demand from passenger fuel cell vehicles. Uh, Martin, then the second question you ask is about price. So, so why isn't this in the price? And I often give the example, um, if you go back two or three years ago, you'll remember there was the same sort of breakthrough discussion around battery electric vehicles. And most automakers said that they would reduce their carbon emissions or their CO2 emissions uh, by selling more battery vehicles. And battery vehicles have struggled to get from 1% to even close to 5% in Europe over four or five years. But the market was expecting that to get to 20 or 25%. And when that expectation was in the market, there was a billion dollars invested in the lithium ETF, assuming that battery vehicles would go to 30%. And that was quite sensible. People that wanted to take a view on battery vehicles could invest in lithium. The fascinating thing is that you've got a few hundred thousand ounces of platinum demand in the short term, and you know, close to a million ounces in the slightly longer term, but there isn't any money yet in platinum for people that want to take a view on the hydrogen economy. So what we see going on uh, in, in the market is that you've had, uh, with COVID, a massive rush into precious metals. Gold has run, silver has run, even the industrial metals like copper have run, and platinum is lagging behind. And we think for two reasons. One, that the link between the hydrogen economy and uh, platinum hasn't been made by too many. It's a great opportunity for people wanting to take a position in an investment in the hydrogen economy, they can invest in platinum. 
And we had, with COVID, a lot of shortage of platinum bars, and there was a hiccup on the NYMEX futures market. And what you had is the futures market tends to track the gold price, which is kind of fully priced, uh, but the platinum price still is not reflecting the three main changes. One, the hydrogen economy and that demand. Two, substitution into um, gasoline uh, cat catalysis to replace a uh, very high cost uh, palladium. And the third one I mentioned is that if this transition between internal combustion to electric is slower because of the cost of COVID, then the mild hybrid diesel certainly is a very low CO2 emitting vehicle. So we think more diesel vehicles on the road will be part of the solution to get us uh, through COVID and be most cost effective while embracing this hydrogen economy. You spoke about breakthroughs and there seems to be surprising breakthroughs when you least expect it. And the one is that we associate battery electric vehicles with non-platinum uh, metals, lithium and other metals. Yet we had the announcement coming out of Canada that platinum group metals can now be used in battery electric vehicles. So there could still be surprises going forward on the technical front. Well, certainly. I mean, I think, you know, what, what, always, um, what always pleases me when I speak to, to scientists who speak to, to PhDs that have been working on this metal is that they, you know, they change a, a small ratio between platinum and another metal and they get, you know, 80% uh, improvement in performance and their eyes light up. So I think we're still scratching the surface of just how wonderful these platinum group metals are in isolation uh, and together. And the other interesting thing is that there's still this belief that a battery vehicle is zero emission um, and there's not too much focus on the uh, CO2 emissions to produce that battery and certainly at the end of life uh, to get rid of that battery. So the, you know, the, the battery vehicle does tend to remove um, CO2 emissions or any emissions uh, from the city centre, but it takes that um, CO2 and moves it to the power station. And if you're using coal-fired power stations to charge your battery vehicle, you certainly aren't helping the environment. The, the generation of green hydrogen, that's why it's so sustainable. That's why this debate is really a big changer and certainly has been helped along during COVID. And it is, it's a sustainable fuel source. So I think the battery electric vehicle will have its place, but it's not sustainable unless it's uh, renewable uh, power. And the other benefit is that if you want to increase the use of renewables, you do have to store electricity and that's kind of hard to do. The UK still switches off uh, peak Scottish wind because it, it can't use it. But if you can store that as hydrogen, suddenly you make that hydrogen available for trucks and then ultimately for cars. So I think the hydrogen economy uh, talks to uh, power generation. It talks to the large users uh, of electricity that can be, uh, and, and fossil fuels. Uh, certainly there's a lot, lot of heavy industry that uses fossil fuels that can switch to hydrogen. So it's got so many benefits and it's a long-term game changer. And platinum sits right in that sweet spot. You know, it's, it's part of generating, it's part of using, uh, and certainly uh, a, an easy way to get exposure to an investment in, in the growth of this hydrogen economy. Are there any insurmountable issues when it comes to using existing pipelines and tanks and storage? And are there any special precautions that have to be taken with the hydrogen storage? So certainly, Martin, I think you know, some people do still think that fuel cell technology is a new technology when it really isn't. It's been around since the 1800s. It was used on the Apollo mission to the moon. So, so fuel cell technology is well known. And that's why I could quite comfortably uh, assume that the loadings in the Ballard fuel cell stack is pretty similar to the Hyundai who make their own fuel cell stacks, pretty similar. This technology has been refined and improved over time. And the storage of hydrogen and the safety of hydrogen has been worked on for, for decades. So what you've got is, yes, you certainly do need special precautions at a filling station. Uh, if it is hydrogen in, in China, uh, it's been quite a lot of energy has gone into making sure that the storage of hydrogen isn't treated as a hazardous, uh, hazardous uh, chemical and they're putting rules in place around that. But to, to take a, a filling station and provide a hydrogen tank is, is known. It's a thing that can be done. The other benefit is a, is a company called Nikola that are building uh, fuel cell trucks in the US and, and they've teamed up with, uh, with Ford. Um, and what you're finding is that they want to produce um, hydrogen in, in sort of six zones across the US to allow coast to coast. Their truck has a 1,200 mile range. Uh, and what you're doing there is you're using either solar or, or wind and you're electrolyzing hydrogen on site and storing it in a tank. Um, so that is quite possible to do, and that's part of the rollout. 
And, and the thing that will fill the gap is, yes, a lot of hydrogen will still be taken from fossil fuels, and that's okay as an interim measure. So if you're using fossil fuels and you're using hydrogen um, as an interim arrangement, getting to green hydrogen production is certainly the thing uh, that, that is most sustainable. And so I think a lot of the issues have been resolved over time, and it's not a new technology. Yeah, South Africans, you know, we remember that when Sassel was producing uh, petrol and diesel from burning coal and creating the hydrogen that they needed, we started off by just having a single pump at a petrol station. There would be one pump there that said Sassel. And that's why I always wonder why they are saying there's such big infrastructure development needed. Surely you could just have a single pump to start with. Couldn't it be done on a sort of a modular and gradual basis? Certainly, and, and, and absolutely. I mean, I think the, the, the point that you raise makes me think of the discussion around battery vehicles. Why haven't battery vehicles gone to 20 or 30 percent? One is you need to change your electrical grid, and that's costly for a country. And two, you need to put recharging stations in place. Now, if you pull up to a service station and you've got 10 pumps that provide gasoline or diesel, you can put a few hundred cars through there in a couple of hours quite easily. But if you pull up to that same station and you've only got 10 charging points, as soon as 10 cars are charging, you've got a backup of a few hundred more. So to provide enough charging stations, you need hundreds uh, of charges. Whereas with one hydrogen uh, uh, filling pump, uh, you can fill up trucks and you can fill up uh, obviously a whole lot of vehicles in the same way that you would with gasoline or diesel. So the modular approach is, is twofold. One is you can put a hydrogen filling pump in at a normal service station. So all your infrastructure around it is the same. You can fill up hundreds of cars a day easily. And what you can also do is you can take that hydrogen from fossil fuel uh, and actually use steam reforming to create that hydrogen as an interim measure. And then you can switch to electrolysis and use green hydrogen. So it does have a very um, a sensible way of phasing it in. And previously, when you had these arguments that was almost sort of BH, uh, VHS and beta, they said, you know, battery vehicles have won and fuel cell vehicles have lost. And the issue, it, it really isn't that. It's about a combination of sensibly. And one of the arguments against fuel cell was to say, well, if you're going to get hydrogen from fossil fuels, you're not really doing anything good. Well, the answer is you're still getting electricity from coal-fired power stations, and you're assuming you've done good. But what it is, it's a continuum. And now the debate is that you can actually get a sustainable fuel hydrogen that'll serve fuel cell electric vehicle trucks and then cars. And there's room for battery as well. Battery isn't going away, but certainly it's a technology that, that doesn't quite solve the, the carbon emissions problem, whereas hydrogen does. That was Crema Media's Mining Weekly, speaking to Trevor Raymond, the Director of Research at the World Platinum Investment Council.